Um, I'm Trevor Hubs. I manage the Armed Forces Initiative for Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. This is the third part in our three-part series on how to hunt out west. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, requests for this over, over the years, just uh, folks that first time being stationed in Fort Carson or Joint Base Lewis McCord or up in Fairbanks, Alaska, wanting to know how do I take what I know about whitetails and convert it to where I live now. So uh, the point of these is to get folks uh, the same information we put out at our events throughout the year. Sorry, wait for that, thank you. So it's point is to take uh, the same knowledge that we put out at our events throughout the year and open it up to more people by recording them, putting them on YouTube, making blog posts about them so this doesn't go out to uh, the 1800 people or the 2800 people that we take out every year. It goes out to ideally is an unlimited number because it'll be public on YouTube. Next slide. So next, uh, so tonight we are gonna talk about different species to hunt out west. Uh, it's gonna be like half sixth grade level biology, half kind of tactics for Western hunting, where we're gonna talk about where to find these critters, what they're doing various times of the year, and then some of the best uh, kind of tactics for putting one in your freezer. Next slide. Uh, if you have a question throughout this, just usually raise your hand button or feel free to shout out. There's uh, There's no reason to make this super formal. So first one we're going to go over is antelope. This is my personal, uh, I don't want to say favorite species to hunt out west, but uh, you know, yeah, it is my favorite species to hunt out west. It's the best entry level species uh, as far as gear, as far as likelihood of success, as far as seeing critters. Um, I mean, you can go on a 10 day elk hunt in Montana or Idaho and not see elk and still have a good time, but you can go on a three day antelope hunt and see a thousand antelope, no problem, uh, and across a lot of the west. So you can truck camp for them. They're often on public land, most likely BLM land in Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, um, all these places. It's uh, a really cool species. So the best place to find them is, the, they call it the sagebrush seas or uh, short grass prairie ecosystems. So the best places to find them is gonna be like this Northwest quarter of Wyoming, um, Eastern Montana. I mean, they're all, they're out in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, you could find them all across the West, basically anywhere you have a large sagebrush ecosystems. So these critters migrate, uh, they stick in some areas in the uh, summer where then the food gets scarce in the winter, they're gonna migrate into areas with more sagebrush, which is some of the great, uh, the reason for some of the great stewardship work Backcountry Hunters and Anglers does, uh, where we remove fencing or make it very wildlife, uh, non-restrictive fencing, which normally just means one strand of barbed wire across the top. Because antelope will not jump a fence. I said, there's no hard 100% uh, rules in this world, I've decided. I have seen the biggest antelope of my life jump a fence. That's probably why he got to be the biggest antelope. But I've also seen 100 antelope squeeze under the bottom rung of a three-wire bar barbed wire fence uh, rather than jump it. So super cool critters. Um, Let's see. They are all reliant on vision. So if you, uh, if you have the opportunity to ever see like a Euro mount, or if you knock one down, pay attention to just the physical size of the eye versus like a white tail or versus even an elk, just a huge eyeball, like physically in relation to the size of the brain, size of the head, they rely heavily on vision. So they're gonna be in open area. So when you are pursuing antelope, um, the biggest thing here, sorry, I have my notes that I'm referencing. So the biggest thing to think about is gonna be um, like knee pads and gloves, like you're going to have these little cactuses and it's not so much the big spines that you have to worry about. It's the little spines. The first time I killed an antelope, I was so excited. I dropped my pack and I just flopped down because it's like 80 degrees and I'm hot and I'm just like 12 miles from a road. And I flopped down right in a bunch of cactus and I was picking thorns for months. It seemed like it was it was rough. But uh, yeah, so gloves and knee pads, a lot of like First Light say, uh, and uh, Sitka. They have pants with like knee pads built in. Those are fine. You can also get some like flooring knee pads at uh, Home Depot that are cheaper than a pair of First Light pants. And really, you can hunt these in jeans and a brown t-shirt or a brown flannel or something like. There is enough undulation in the land that if you can sneak up on them, you'll be fine. Uh, the other thing you're going to hear about antelope is uh, far shots are common and they are common, but I've killed two antelope inside of 100 yards one inside of 50 yards. They, 
they don't have to be 500 yard shots. You'll hear a lot of old timers or a lot of folks on the, like the rock slide and the forum saying you got to be ready to shoot 500 or you got to be ready to shoot 750 on these. And it's just not true. If you can shoot to 300, you can take just about any big game in the West. Um, that's not saying you won't have opportunities past 300, but part of the fun of antelope for me is that you get nine, 10 stalks in a day, All right? So I'm going to walk out to a high point, which is going to be relative. Uh, you can see the background picture here is a bunch of antelope in the snow in October in eastern Montana. Um, so the, by the high point, I don't mean in the trees where I can't see, like on the side of that little hill. But a high point where I could see pretty far, which in their habitat is not all, all that high. I'm going to get out there before the sun is up, and I'm just going to watch and wait. Now, the reason I'm out there before the sun is up, you don't have to be necessarily. Like, antelope are going to be active all day. They're always moving around, especially in the first few days of the antelope season, wherever you are. There's other hunters, a lot of road hunters for antelope, because there's a lot of BLM roads, that are going to push antelope around all day. So my biggest way, or the way I find success, is I get as far away from a road as I can. I set on a little rise, and then I just wait for the sun to come up, and other hunters will push antelope to you. Because they're going to be running around all day, and you can get nine, ten stalks in a day to where, okay, you see them, they're 700, 800 yards away. You're picking out, okay, if I get in this little creek bottom, I take seven left turns, and then I can pop up, and they'll be there. And you're doing that kind of like wonky math, trying to count your or how many hills you have to go over. And uh, you're crawling a lot of the way, or hands and knees. And uh, first time I was stalking antelope, I knew, like, saw a group of about 25 going from left to right. They were 1,000 yards away. I picked my spot where I needed to be. I had the low crawl for like 200 yards. So I'm in like ankle, maybe, yeah, ankle high grass, maybe. And I'm just like laying on my face. I got my gun ready. I know they're going to pop out like 200 yards in front of me. And I finally see like, and I'm so low to the ground trying to like barely lift my head up. And I see antlers, like just the points of antlers through the grass, like 200 yards. I'm like, okay, here they come. Looks good. And the closer they get, the they're, they're brown. They're not black antlers. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I kind of raise up a little bit. And there's 15 mule deer with one decent buck at like 80 yards. And I'm like, shit, what happened? So I watched the mule deer and I sit up and I'm like, man, maybe I, uh, maybe I misjudged. Like I wouldn't have missed seen because antelope, they look dramatically different than mule deer. But uh, anyway, I just didn't know what I did wrong. And I'm sitting there kind of drinking water and thinking to myself, like, what the hell happened? And I hear a stomp to my left and 20 yards to my left is the group of antelope. They're getting ready to walk right on top of me. So I just misjudged my distance. But uh it's a good time. It's a good hunt to go on where you are good at making mistakes. Um, let's see another thing. Oh, if you are caping one out for a shoulder mount, um, I plan to do that next time I go hunting. If I get a good one, I've never done a shoulder mount antelope, but the fur is hollow and it's one of their defense mechanisms that the fur will just pull out. Like you can grab a fistful of it and it just comes off. So when you're coming up the back of the, the back of the neck, like for a cape cut, one, go to, they have like a, a stiff mane, kind of like a donkey. So pick a left or a right side of that. Don't try and go right up the middle of the mane. And um, be very gentle. Take your time. Don't grab fur, like a handful of it, just to roll them or anything, because it'll just pop off. Grab uh, the physical animal or grab the hide. Um, all the bucks look really similar. Like it's very easy to find an average antelope because they're everywhere. So some of the things to focus on is uh, if you have a deep V, between the prong and the rest of the horn, or if they're extra wide or extra narrow, you're just looking for stuff that makes that will differentiate the animal. Next slide. Realize I have a bunch of stuff. Um, oh, meat care. Yeah, so these seasons, depending on where you're hunting, like they run sometimes through from August through October. Very rarely will you get some in late October. It's normally August, September, and like the first two weeks of October is when 90% of people are out there hunting antelope. Um, get the meat broken down. You're going to look at it and they're only about 110 pounds, like a, a good antelope. So they're small, smaller than a whitetail. So you're going to get, uh, you're going to look at it and you're like, well, I can fit all of this in one L kind quarter bag. I'm just going to stuff it in there. Don't do that. I've made that mistake. Split it all out, break it down just like you would any other game animal bone in quarters and just separate that meat out. So you get more air circulation and, uh, just it. Trust me, you're going to be tempted to just stuff it all in your bag because it's so small and rock off with it. Don't uh, do not do that. Split it up. Um, hang meat as soon as you can. Get it. Uh, I know trees are like at a premium. So you can have like, a, I have like a 
a topper on the back of my truck that I end up sleeping with. You can hang meat off of there to where it's in the shade, not inside all buttoned up, but just always in the shade, basically using my truck as an artificial sun blocker and then constantly moving the meat. Um, the meat does dry out quick, especially if you're, you grew up in the East and you're an Eastern kind of humid, uh, landscape hunter. It is something different just in that arid landscape at, uh, how fast this meat will get a crust on it. It's pretty, pretty interesting, but, uh, also a little spooky. Next slide. So I'm going to try and sprinkle, uh, I'm sprinkling recipes in here. Again, you'll get all this stuff, so you don't need to like write it down. I call this the You Fed It Not Miss Burger. If you're, a, uh, if you're a Bob's Burgers fans, that's where the inspiration comes from. I think this is best with antelope, but it works with really any kind of red game meat. Um, essentially, it's feta, feta cheese, like the crumbly kind, not the chunk kind. The crumbly kind works better. You can mash it into a bun. Onion bun, feta cheese, uh, dates, and burger and lettuce, and that's about it, and it's pretty good. Uh, you use honey and you make some sort of like a honey cayenne pepper mustard sauce. It, it's pretty good. I think it's best with antelope because antelope you'll find is very sagey and not, not in a bad way. People say that like it's a negative connotation. I don't think it's negative that it's sagey. You just have to know that going in. So if you're making sausage or you're doing something with the meat, you don't add additional sage. Um, if you're doing, if you're dead set on doing your own like bratwurst or summer sausage out of antelope and you're like, man, I don't know how this is going to taste. Grind it regular before you put any seasoning in it throw a little bit on a pan and just cook a little bit up a little meatball for yourself. And you'll, you'll immediately detect it like, Oh, okay. So just half the sage or even a quarter of the sage you would normally put in your recipe, but it's up to your taste buds. It's, it's totally on you. There's a uh, antelope is some of the best meat out there. Like my family loves it. We eat it all, all the time. Uh, I try and take at least one of these down a year if I can chat. Awesome. Yeah. So you see uh, the buck has a distinctive black band under its lower jaw. Um, like I know it's a black and white picture and it's very dark, but the does don't have any black. These are, you're going to spot these things from three miles out. Um, the biggest thing is the top is tan, the same color tan as the sagey uh, landscape around it. But that white patch on the flank and especially on the rump just shines in the desert. It's incredible. You can see them from so far away. But that black patch on the throat is, uh, is pretty distinctive. The black patch on the throat and then also the front of the nose on bucks is going to be very, very dark. And you'll see that. And then if you look at its front leg, again, black and white picture, the uh, you see that little baseball sized white patch among the uh, the brown that that's that's where you want to go with it. Next slide. I think I have a color picture in here somewhere. There we go. So you see how that uh, picture on the on everybody's left, right? That yearling buck antelope has those smaller horns. The doe on the far left has even smaller horns than that. But uh, Really what you're looking for is you're looking for something that is out. It should be double your, the ear length of the critter. That's, that's what you're looking for in a mature two, three-year-old antelope. And then if you really wanted to get exciting, you're looking for something that's either super wide or just super deep forks. Um, cool thing about antelope is antelope are the only critter with horns that shed the horns. You'll find the sheds out there just walking around. Um, pretty interesting. And then if you're doing a Euro mount, go ahead and, uh, you could just let that whole hide on head sit for about seven days, depending on the, your weather. And you could just pop those horns right off their sheath. And you could set those horns aside for the winter or whatever. Let your beetles clean it, boil it, whatever you want to do. And then at the end, you just pop those horns right back on their sheath. They have a bone sheath that goes up about halfway. And uh, the horns just sit right back on there. Some people glue them back down. I just set them on there. And uh, that way I can pull it off and show people. And it's kind of cool. Next slide. Uh, there's the burger. Next slide. All right, next, we're on a mule deer. Uh, mule deer, very, very close. Um, if you haven't picked up in the first couple uh, episodes of this, I am a creature of the plains. I love that short grass prairie ecosystem. The mountains are really cool, but I really like the plains. I like hunting on the plains. I think they're, they're neat. Um, but yeah, mule deer, they're iconic to the West. They're all over the place. Um, they thrive in habitats that have a combination of like sagebrush, short grass prairie, and um, intermittent trees or intermittent uh, spruce pine trees. Um, let's see. The more diverse uh, like species of grasses, the more diverse the sage, the more diverse the, the vegetation there, 
the uh, the better off mule deer are going to be. That makes better habitat because they can go through different nutrient sti- uh, nutrient cycles uh, based on time of the year, and they are not as sage dependent as antelope are. Antelope will always be in the sage. Mule deer, like you'll see in the background picture there, that's where I killed um, my biggest antelope buck, or I'm sorry, my biggest mule deer buck is uh, that kind of short grass rolling hills prairie where there really wasn't a ton of sage, but there's intermittent trees and a lot of that short grass that made it. Uh, pretty big mule deer cover, or pretty good mule deer cover. Next slide. So the hunting considerations, mule deer are much harder to see than antelope. So they blend in um, a lot better. Antelope, we talked about, they have that big white patch on their belly. Um, these don't have, they don't have a big white patch on their belly. Uh, you could be looking over bedded mule deer a lot easier than you're gonna look over bedded antelope. Uh, crepuscular, unlike antelope, which are gonna be active all day, mule deer, kind of like whitetails, you've got you know an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And uh, that's about it. Now that's not saying they aren't uh, moving, that's just when they are easiest to see. Now, the other interesting thing is mule deer, unlike whitetails where one, you have so much managed whitetail property, but also just the population is different where you can have a one-to-one or a two-to-one doe-to-buck ratio. In most parts of the world where I have mule deer hunted, I'm seeing like a 25 to one doe-to-buck ratio. And I don't know, like this is Trevor speaking from, you know, years of experience. I don't know if that is Trevor hunting them wrong or if that's the reality of the herd. I've heard both answers from biologists and it's going to depend on where you're hunting them in the world. Uh, like that Southern or that Southwestern or South Central area of Colorado has some of the best mule deer hunting in the United States. And that's what their buck to doe ratio looks like. Bucks will get a harem of critters. So uh, I don't know if you guys can see one, one of these is a, is a mule deer and uh, a lot of them are white tails, but one of them is a mule deer. And I looked at 76 mule deer doe before I found this four by four mule deer behind me. And uh, that's been the story of every hunt. Like I see a lot of forkies and I see uh, some two pointers, but the uh, four by four is tough to come by. Um, Let's see, so 400 yard shots are common, uh, but again, you can creep to within 300 yards of uh, of mule deer. Um, People will tell you that you have to shoot far. You don't have to shoot far. Again, if you are comfortable with 300, you can take down just about any critter out west. But 400 yards shots are common. I think I shot mine at 298, and that's the longest shot I have taken on a uh, in a hunting scenario. Um, let's see. Yeah, the hundred. I use 127 grain Barnes uh, copper bullet. I shoot. Uh, I shoot a Weatherby. You don't have to use a copper bullet, but I've been very impressed with it. I've used that round on any the, everything from antelope to caribou, to black bear, elk. I think it's great. Um, Anything from like a small 6.5 Creedmoor up to a 300 Win Mag are all good calibers. Um, you, If I was going to buy one gun for the West, it would be a 300 Win Mag. Um, the 300 Weatherby Mag is great too. The difference is you'd have to really prepare because you don't know that all gun stores are going to carry that Weatherby specialty cartridge. But I do believe in the Weatherby cartridges. My go-to for everything is the uh, the Weatherby 6.5 300, which is a 6.5 uh, Creedmoor size slug. With 300 with a 300 wind mags powder, so it's flat to 400. I love it. Um, shameless sales pitch for Weatherby. They are a sponsor, but I love that uh, that rifle. But you'll be fine. Anything you shoot a whitetail with will shoot a mule deer. They're a little bigger, but you'll be all right. Next slide. Hey Trevor, real quick, just to yeah, man. further expound on what you were talking about um, when it comes to ratios and stuff. Um, I've I've hunted 10 different GMUs in Washington for mule deer. And it seems like everything I always came across was like anywhere from that 20 to 25 to one ratio. And that's not saying there's not, you know, satellite bucks out there and that stuff, but for like a good herd buck, that's normally what it is. And, you know, use your biologist, contact them, ask them, say, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about hunting in this unit. What's, what's the ratios look like. And they'll be so excited that somebody called them. That they'll just start vomiting information at you. No, that's a great, uh, that's a great call out, Dustin. Uh, people never want to talk to the biologist and they are a wealth of information. Um, nobody make fun of me. This is my biggest mule deer buck to date. I'm super proud of him. Um, I know there's a lot bigger ones out there, but this is public land DIY. Really nice. Uh, very happy with this prairie mule deer. Um, so the season structure is different based on the region you're in, but typically archery is going to run from like early September through mid to late October. 
You'll have a rifle season that's late October through December. Uh, this buck is, I think it's October, I don't know, 28th or something. It was real close to Halloween because um, I had to get home to take my kids trick-or-treating. I remember being kind of a rush to pack it up out of this little gully it was in. Uh, then you'll have like shoulder seasons in some states that will be like early in August. That'll typically be like an antlerless or a doe only permit uh, meant to like help uh, ag or wheat farmers out. Um, and then you'll have a late one, same thing out to like February in some zones where they are a problem or they are uh, ag damage, doing ag damage. Then you'll have muzzleloader tags intermittent throughout there. Now the tag type is going to be different based on the uh, the state you're in, but in general, you have an A tag, which is normally a buck only tag or an either sex tag and a B tag, which is a doe or a fawn tag. Now, some states call it a type one tag or a type two tag. And then Wyoming goes all the way down to like a type six tag, which is various regulations depending on the unit you're in. But in general, you want a type one or an A tag and that'll be a buck tag. And everything else is some combination of doe or spike or fawn or whatever. So Read your regulations on the state you're planning on hunting, but in general, that type one or that A tag is what you want if you'd like a buck. Next slide. Did it go for anybody else? It's being slow. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. here we go. Nope, so uh, the biggest thing, uh, especially, honestly, whitetails are in almost every state now. So, I mean, they have whitetails in Alaska believe it or not. But uh, the, so a lot of states, it will be a mule deer or whitetail tag, depending on the zone you're in. But um, the biggest way to tell the difference is the black tip on the tail. Like you're going to look at your first mule deer and you're going to say, well, that has a, a white tail on it. Like that's, that's oddly deceiving. It does have a white tail until you see it next to an actual white tail deer. Uh, the mule deer's tail is actually much more of a gray and it's pretty distinguishable. It also has a black tip on the end and they aren't going to spike that tail up and flash like a white tail will. Uh, it'll hang down like a dog and kind of wag. Also, the ears are a pretty big giveaway. Um, when I tell people like mule deer have bigger ears, it seems like I'm not really going to be able to tell that. It's it's pretty obvious. Like with a white tail, normally for a mature buck, you're looking for something that has a spread larger than the ears. If it has a spread larger than a mule deer ear, harvest that animal. Like that's a big mule deer. Um, you, there's a lot of places, a lot of states will give courses on. I know Montana does one where it'll just run you through about 20 slides and you have to pick mule deer or whitetail and it'll give you a grade. Hey, this is what you got wrong. This is what you got right. Try again. Um, completely free. So highly recommend doing that. Next slide. All right, next we are going to get into elk. Um, I know a lot of people want to go hunt elk as their first animal. It is an iconic Western game animal. They are awesome. They taste great. I can't say a bad thing about elk. Um, I actually got the privilege last year to accompany for work for AFI. Um, we got to, I got to accompany a bunch of students on a learned elk event in the short grass prairie ecosystems of Eastern Montana, which is super rare. Um, the elk are traditionally a prairie animal and it's humans that kind of push them into the mountains over the years. So interesting that they are now coming back to the, uh, the prairie. But a newborn calf is about 35 pounds, uh, but then at a full grown, full grown, a Rocky Mountain elk is going to be 500 pounds. A Thule elk is going to be 300 and a Roosevelt elk is going to be about 600. So those are the three kind of elk we have left. Some people count Eastern elk because we've had elk in Kentucky for multiple generations now that have now spread, you know, Missouri, Arkansas, Wisconsin, all these, Minnesota has an elk herd that yes, they are technically Eastern elk, but they're not. It depends on the biologist you're talking to. So for these purposes, we're going to look at these three species of elk, which is Thule elk, which is in a part of California. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it's hard to draw a tag for, but they're pretty neat if you ever get the chance. And if you're from California, I think you should try and apply. If you're not from California, go ahead and get points and apply if you if you would like to, but it is a very hard to draw tag. Roosevelt elk are going to be on the west side of Washington, west side of Oregon, and then up in certain parts of Alaska, and they tend to be larger uh, body-wise, smaller racks, larger body, and uh, then the Rocky Mountain elk, which will be in between the two. And that's that's typically what you're looking at from the Arizona, New Mexico, all the way up through Idaho and Montana kind of corridor there of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, a bull is going to be about 700 pounds, five feet at the shoulder, eight feet from nose to tail. They're big. They're big. You get a bull on the ground, you knock it down, and you're 
300 yards away, you walk up on it, and holy smokes, you uh, you very quickly realize how uh, how tough it's going to be to carry out. So elk, like uh, like mule deer, they survive on a variety of different animals. They are not like antelope, where they're almost exclusively on sage. So if you have grass, if you have herbs, tree bark, twigs, the more diversity of plants you have, the better elk habitat you're going to get. Uh, ivories. I was a DIY elk hunter for a while and I had no idea about ivories. Nobody ever told me about them. So ivories are the top two canine teeth in an elk. So they're actually made out of ivory, not regular teeth. You'll be able to tell when you open them up, but you can cut those out. And, uh, so people like necklaces, bolo ties, they're pretty neat to hang on to. Um, they're not, not, not many, uh, North American species are throwing ivory. So it's kind of cool. Let's see. Uh, they are scientists believe the ivories are remnants of saber-like tusks that used to grow instead of antlers. And anyway, most humans save the ivories. If you don't want your ivories, cut them out anyway and give them to me. That'd be cool. But uh, body posture. When alarmed, elk will raise their head high, open their eyes wide. They act like an animal that knows you're there. There's not really a uh, a huge difference. Ninety nine percent of the year. Uh, there's a senior cow or a senior female elk that is going to be in charge of the whole herd, and they're going to dictate what that herd does or does not do. That only changes during the rut, which is depending on the weather, hormones, uh, proper calorie intake, somewhere between mid-September and mid-October, most places. Um, and during that time, the bull is kind of in charge. He's going to herd away several select cows that he will then uh, mate with and make baby elk. So... Let's see. Next slide. I think that's all I got on this one. Uh, elk range and habitat. Prior to European settlement, uh, they were 10 million of them. They were all over out to Virginia. You'd be hunting elk and um, West Virginia, North Carolina, Ontario. Pretty cool. Uh, food, water, shelter, and space are essential to elk survival. So, like, the biggest thing, the difference between mule deer, antelope, elk, and whitetails is a whitetail doe, on average, will not leave a nine-square-mile space her entire life. Elk, mule deer, antelope are making 100, 600, 700 mile migrations at times based on seasonality, based on availability of food. So just because you saw elk on this mountain at one point doesn't mean that they're going to be on that mountain all year. Doesn't mean that they're going to be on that mountain in that five year time frame. They could never come back. You never know. So they are much more widely, uh, I don't want to say widely distributed, but wide ranging. Um, next slide. So habitat map, I know it's kind of hard to see. Uh, I could have used some brighter colors, but uh, the yellow, you have the eastern elk, which is technically, some scientists will say it has been extirpated and is extinct, but we have reintroduced Rocky Mountain elk to the east. So then we have a new breed of eastern elk, some folks would argue. Uh, you have Rocky Mountain elk in the Rocky Mountains. You have tool elk, which is that little like reddish brown area in California. And then you have Roosevelt elk, which is the green area going up through Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and technically parts of Northern California as well. Um, next slide. Uh, oh, that's just a picture of one of our AFI members. Uh, he shot, that's technically a spike elk. This is a good uh, teaching point. So that is a spike tule elk. And I know it, you can say, see it forks at the top, but legally in California, that counts as a spike. So pay attention to what is a bull, what is a spike, what is a cow, and it's going to vary by your state regulations and vary by the unit you're in. So several units in California, or I'm sorry, in Montana, will be bull-only units. And what they mean by that, bulls, you got to flip back seven pages or whatever, go to the identification or the definition page, and a bull will say a bull elk has a brow tine of at least six inches. And that is what they are considering a bull. So if you see this elk here has no brow tine. A brow tine is the first point that comes off the uh, the elk's antlers right above it, his eyes. It's like an eye guard, some folks would call it. But depending on the state you're in, some states will not classify it as a bull elk unless it has a brow tine. Some states will say there's a point restriction where it has to have four points. I don't care where they are. Some states will say a spike elk is only a spike. It has to be one single spike more than six inches. Some will say a spike elk is something that is a bull elk, but not with, but without four points or fewer or without a brow tine. Like in this case, uh, this is a spike elk, even though it branches at the top because it does not have a brow tine. So just a note, pay attention to what tag you drew and what qualifies. Now, some states will say um, 
you get into things where elk will break off an antler just like a whitetail will when they're fighting and uh some states some units will be a six by six and then you'll get or you could draw a tag that is damage bull only which in which case you're looking for a bull with one intact or, bro or one intact or no intact antlers where he broke both of them it's just interesting and it's definitely something to pay attention to uh we talked about it with antelope we talked about it with mule deer Pay attention to the type of tag you have and what that means in your specific unit. Next slide. Oh, we have a bunch of elk left. All right, cool. Um, elk vocalizations, all kinds of uh, of elk vocalizations. The bugle is probably what everybody uh, everybody thinks about. Everybody's heard on the YouTube. They heard Randy Newberg, Steve Ranella, all bugle. It's easier than you think. Um, I'm not great at it, but you don't actually have to be great at it. I get a lot farther cow calling than I do uh, than I do bugling, and uh, I mean it feels a lot cooler to bugle, but I don't know. Part of that is because I've never been a super big caller. I'd rather just be sneaky in the woods and figure out where the elk are, try to put myself in that same area, and just kind of mew and call, call, call cow call out a little bit. Uh, now, that said, if you are interested in becoming a caller or you live in specific regions where calling is the only way to do it, and that's how everybody hunts elk, highly recommend uh, you watch some of these YouTube videos on calling. It is not that hard to master, especially if you are a uh, you commute to work and you're in your car alone for a while. Like, stick that bugle tube, that mouth call in your car, and just blow while you're uh, while you're driving. You'll get better in a couple weeks, pretty pretty quickly. Next slide. Hey, Trevor, real quick, just to yeah. expand on what you're saying here. Um, you're absolutely right when it comes to bugling and calling. Uh, you know, the old timers would always say the only thing worse than uh, no call is a bad call. And that's 100% not true. I've bugled in mo more bulls with really, really, really bad sounds through a bugle tube than I ever had with a, you know, with a perfect bugle. And I always found that if I was chasing a bugle and it sounded perfect, it was another dude or another hunter. <laughs> so no, that's, uh, yeah. Just some food for thought there, fellas. That's, uh, if you ever go to like September 1st, uh, opening for over-the-counter archery elk in Colorado and you're up on public land and the mountain just explodes with bugles, you're like, oh, wow. No, it's all dudes, man. It's all other people. And it's uh, it's interesting. But uh, some just elk basics here. Elk breed in the fall. Bulls gather cows and calves as a small group it's called harems. Bulls wallow in the mud and they pee on themselves and uh, they give, uh, what's it called? Like, uh, what am I thinking here? What kinds of hormones and stuff and they have secretions and they're just all all muddied up and disgusting. Uh, but it's acts as kind of perfume to help them attract cows. They will bugle, they will rub trees and shrubs. Uh, that's where you've seen folks uh, like carry a, an oil an oil bottle or a shed with them and just rake trees as a way to call elk in um some people swear by it i have not done like the the raking of stuff to put to call elk in now i will like scrape in the ground and make a little bit of a ruckus because these animals are big like we said 600 pounds for a bull they're not drifting through some thick timber quiet um the reason bugling would work is because bulls will aggressively guard their harem from other bulls. So if you approach a bull with a harem and you bugle and you appear to be a smaller bull than he is, he may come try and fight you and then you get a shot at him. That's that's kind of the goal, right? But um, I again, I found just as much success cow calling as I have something else. Just I just want to make that bull come take a look. I, I want him to be just curious enough to get within 30 or 25 yards uh, with archer equipment. Um, let's see. Uh, if you are, if you draw an L rifle elk tag, um, if it's like early October in some special unit, you could still be worthwhile to bugle. But uh, if you're out there in November in Montana during the general season, don't bring a, a bugle tube. It's it's just going to, it's not going to be useful at that time of year. Bugling is effective during the rut. It's not effective at all times of the year. Um, next slide. Also, to, real quick, I'm I'm going to change it. But uh, when you talk about bugling, uh, one thing I always notice is I did have better luck if I tried to talk to the cows. Like the bulls got his cows in a herd, I'm trying to talk to the cows because bulls are like human human males, right? Somebody talks to a man's wife or girlfriend, they're going to get jealous and they're going to come investigate it, right? So they think the same way, especially in the rut. They're all 
rutted up and hormoned up and they're just ready to fight. So talk to the cows. You will be successful. Yep. Um, so now we're just going to go over season, same as we do with mule deer. Very, very similar. Archery season is going to be generally early September through mid to late October, depending on your state. I know Colorado has some very early October rifle seasons. They also have their muzzleloader season lumped in with their archery season. So this depends on the state you're in. But generally, earlier is archery. Rifle is going to be kind of your, your Thanksgiving time frame or your November. You'll have some shoulder seasons for some cow tags or some spike tags, again, generally associated with agriculture and damage permits. And then different states will put different muzzleloader, different primitive seasons in there as well. S very similar to mule deer, a type one tag or a type or a, a tag is going to be a buck or either sex. Type B tag will be a doe or a fawn, depending on the state you're in. Pay attention to what you're applying for. Next. Uh, packing out an elk, it's uh, it's a real thing. Get uh, get ready for it. I have never packed out an elk by myself. I've always kind of uh, been very fortunate to have somebody in the area. Uh, but I do know a guy, one of the folks that we took uh, like on our introduction to Western hunting, which is this class, but in real life, uh, we were targeting antelope. And two weeks after he shot his first antelope, he shot his first elk. And he had no one to call. And he was like 10 miles away from a road. And he did it all himself. And it took him 16 hours. And he was a fit dude. So it, it is no joke like this. The, the work truly does start when you're packing out an elk. Now, that said, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to tell you what is better for your body or worse for your body. I'm going to tell you what my body likes to do and then let you make your own decisions. So just so you know, a bull bone in is still 350 pounds of meat off the bone. You can cut about 100 pounds off, maybe 250 cow, 250 to on the bone, off the bone, 150. A head slash head and cape, 39 pounds, could be up to 60 pounds, depending on uh, how much skull, how much tissue, how much neck, all that stuff that you leave in there. Um, don't leave meat in the field. The head has to be the last thing to come out of the field. Uh, otherwise, uh, you run into wanton waste laws. You want to take all that available meat. Again, that's different by state. In Alaska, you have to take out all four quarters, the neck, meat, and the ribs, and the ribs have to be bone in. Most states will let you bone out the ribs. Just depends on your state. Read your regulations. Call your local game warden. Ask them. My advice on packing out, what, what makes my body feel better when packing out elk is if I make five trips with around 50 to 55 pounds per trip. So I do each quarter essentially is one, and then I'll, I will do the rib meat and the head on the last one. Or I guess the rib slash burger slash trim, like all that extra stuff on the last trip. Uh, thoughts, Dustin? Actually, I'm I completely agree with you. Um, it, you know, if, if if you happen to get your elk right by a road or something, I mean, if you're lucky and it's it, it it's within walking distance to a road, then sure you can you can take quarters, right? But I, I've never been that lucky, and I have always had to bone everything out. That's honestly, for me, that's the only way to fly. Yeah, okay. It, it makes me feel not like uh, not like such a wussy, so that's nice. Uh, next slide. Oh, you're not a wussy. They're freaking heavy. It's it's a lot. I I'm always a less weight, more trips, than less trips, more weight. Um, eight you years didn't... airborne infantry. My knees don't need any more stress. You didn't even address the real elephant in the room and the fact of the adrenaline dump that you have after you fire that <laughs> shot and that you are just almost completely worthless. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. That's. um, Yeah, it's it take multiple days, just especially if it's later in October, or November, like let that meat hang, like relax and uh, take your time. It doesn't it doesn't get easier if you rush. Just go slow. But anyway, now on to moose. Now, fair, fair play. I have never hunted a moose. I have been on moose hunts with people. Uh, in most of the lower 48, your moose tag is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime tag. And uh, that's a once-in-a-lifetime per state. So if you draw one in Idaho, you could still draw one in Montana, still draw one in Colorado, but it's once per state. So moose, uh, moose are actually called elk in Europe, which I thought was interesting. Um, largest member of the deer family, the Alaska Yukon is the largest of all the moose creatures. Um, they're reddish, they're brown, but honestly, they look black. Like you'll be able to see, like the most moose I see is, I've ever seen is in Colorado when I'm black bear hunting. 
because I'm looking for big dark objects and the moose look just about black. Like they do not look, I know this says red and brown, which they, they are red or brown, but compared to mule deer, compared to elk even, they are black out there. Like they are so dark. So like you'll see something you think, ooh, it's a color phase black bear or it's a, it's just a black bear and it's it's a moose. Um, not telling anybody to go moose hunt in Colorado, but uh, that is where I've seen the most moose. Now the biggest moose I've seen are in Montana, but that's just because I have never seen a moose in Alaska and I'd really like to. Anyway, moose are often recognized by their antlers carried only by the males. There's bony protrusions that uh, the older the bulls, the bigger the uh, bigger the antlers get. Uh, the biggest ones are normally when they're 10 to 12 years old. After that point, they go downhill because they stopped getting the amount of calories they need just because they're older, their teeth are worn down, their joints, all that stuff. Next. So a couple of different moose subspecies here. So eastern moose is going to be what you have in Maine. It's going to be eastern Canada. You're going to have you run into them in Wisconsin, you run into them in Minnesota and Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Like I know they exist. Uh, check your regulations on even on picking up uh, sheds out there, though. Like I've, I've heard multiple, multiple things from multiple game wardens in the same state on the legality of collecting moose sheds. Um, that's specifically in Wisconsin, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. But they say Maine is one of the easier places in the lower 48 to draw a moose tag. It's still going to take you a long time. But anyway, uh, Eastern Moose. Eastern Canada and the uh, Northern Boreal Forest. Western Canadian moose is that green area there. So there's a magic line between the Shiras moose and the Western Canada moose. The Shiras moose is that red line there, and that's basically the moose of the lower 48. So Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, um, Wyoming, obviously miss Wyoming, uh, but that's a Shiras moose. So those are the moose that I have seen the... Um, the most uh, biggest moose I've ever seen was two bull moose in September in Montana. I was driving back from uh, an elk glassing spot at uh, like dusk and I see a couple cars pulled over and I'm like, oh, what are they doing? I go to drive past them and just hear what sounds like a forklift full of two by fours, drop them on the floor of a Home Depot, like a, like a concrete floor. And it's two huge bull moose just clacking together in this field. Like it's a dirt field just tilled up and they're fighting and it's two big bulls and one cow. And these bulls were just fighting. This cow was just standing there. And then off even further, it was two much smaller bulls, which were probably that cow's twins of the year. Just like watching the whole thing. It was wild. It was, uh, it was like two F two fifties just smacking into each other. They were, they were huge. And the Shiras moose are the, the smallest of the moose species. Finally, you have the Alaska moose, which is sometimes called the Yukon moose, and that's moose in Alaska. Again, you have a uh, an imaginary line where if it occurs on the west side of that line, it's an Alaska moose. And if it's on the east side of that line, it's a northwestern Canada moose or western Canada moose. Next slide. Ah, uh, this is a white moose. It's a, uh, What's it called? PowerPoint. Microsoft added that picture in there automatically. Sorry about that. Let it slip through. But uh, these are up to 1,600 pounds. These are generally in the northern forests. They are not going to be on the sage flats. These are in these are deep timber, like or uh, either deep timber or like tundra species or sub tundra, subarctic. Um, they eat willow birch, aspen leaves, twigs, along with sedges, pond weeds, grasses. That kind of iconic look as a moose standing knee deep in the pond and eating wild rice and stuff definitely happens most of the moose i have seen have been in willows down by small streams in the mountains that's that's where you run into them uh, wolves black bears brown bears are their predators usually they have one calf a year sometimes twin occur twins occur moose populations are rebounding in the lower 48 and alaska but uh, for a long time they called the uh before the governor's tag was a thing, which we went over in section one, they called the moose tag in Colorado the governor's tag because you had to be the governor to get one, which is, you know, not true, but it was just how rare they were. Anyway, next piece, next slide. Um, So this is a cow moose that I ran into while black bear hunting in Colorado. At, it's hard to see from that picture, but that's like 25 yards. And the poor thing just kept running right down the trail I was walking on. So she was just like always 25 yards in front of me for like a mile. Felt like I was going to stomp to death, but uh, similar season structure to elk. It is a once in a lifetime tag in most states, meaning that once you draw a bull moose tag in North Dakota, Colorado, whatever, you cannot draw a bull moose tag in that state again. Um, 
for shooting 300 win Ma- Winchester Magnum, Weatherby Magnum. Um, what's the uh, a new fancy one from Weatherby? But any, any of those larger cartridges are going to do it for you. You could do it with a 6.5, theoretically. I would not recommend that. I would not. I mean, you maybe a 270. 30-06 will probably work. The thing will, the thing will knock a lot down. Um, but anyway, anyway, the 30 caliber and larger is probably what you want. Next. Uh, next, all right, we're going to talk about mountain goat. Again, now we're getting into the species that I have not hunted personally. I may have been on hunts for some of them, but not for uh, for myself. I've been uh, accompanying people. So take all that with a grain of salt. I'm going to teach you what I know about them. And if you draw a tag somewhere, I would highly recommend you call somebody else that isn't me for more information. So habitat, mountain goats, uh, super high up. So Mike, if you we look at... Uh, if you look at kind of like a tiered system with antelope on the low ground in the sage flats, little higher up, you'll have mule deer that will cross over to the sage flats. A little higher up even then, you'll have elk, which uh, elk and moose are going to be in the same kind of areas up on the mountains that could come down in the sage. Elk will, moose will not. And then even higher than that, you have sheep on the mountain. And then even higher than the sheep, you have the goats. So like, anyway, a uh, little known fact about mountain goats they're up to 385 pounds. Like a big mountain goat is bigger than your biggest mule deer. Like it's a big critter when you knock one down. Um, they're extremely remote habitat. Um, let's see. Next, uh, let's see. They have distributed. They're throughout Southeast Alaska along coastal mountains into the South Central. Now they have been transplanted or replanted, reintroduced to several mountain ranges in the lower 48. Um, there's a little can... Uh, contention between whether mountain goats belong in some of these ranges uh that's that's another discussion but really the mountain goats biggest uh biggest defense the biggest way to stay safe is to be where other things are not so if it's a pain in the ass to get there it's probably mountain goat country or you're just the size is dusting in me and everywhere's a pain in the ass to get to let's see um wolves and bears their biggest predators but normally once they get to an adult uh, adult size they are they, they die of old age or they die of starvation or something like that. Uh, reproduction, a single kid is most common. Twinning is very rare. Mountain goats are very sure-footed climbers, specifically adapted hooks for climbing in rough and slippery terrain. They are the most charismatic species and inhabit one of the most spectacular landscapes on earth. Next slide. Again, a mountain goat is going to be one of these uh, like once-in-a-lifetime critters. So Alaska uh, has this video on a billy or a... What's it called? Uh, a U mountain goat? Not a U. What's it? What do they call the lady mountain goats? Just male or female? Is a U? Anyway, they look super similar. Like you can see these two pictures. Um, one is a Billy. That's me. We all have the same right and left, right? The left one is going to be a female, and the one on the right is going to be a male. Now you can see the one on the right will have a broader, less narrow. Is that, I shouldn't say broad. I should say less narrow head. The eye will generally be smaller than the base of the antlers. The antlers will um, will have a different curvature than the females will. Uh, billy will often have a beard. A mature billy and a mature female, much easier to tell apart than a two-year-old billy and a mature female. Like That's the, the real difference. Um, again, there's not one solid way where you're looking at, at these, de- uh, these uh, goats. You're going to say, well, that's clearly a billy. You're looking at seven or eight different factors. You're watching for behavior. You're seeing, are there any small goats around does it have a pea stain on its uh, rump like a like a female would or is it a pea stain up front like a male would because of you know the various differences genetically between males and females um but anyway alaska fishing game puts out this very good video on how to determine now in the lower or in uh, alaska they have some rules where if you shoot a female mountain goat you may not draw a tag for four years kind of like a punishment um, in the lower 48, some places have those rules, some places do not, just because the tags are so rare. But if everyone made the effort to shoot only male mountain goats, they would rebound that much faster, and you would, uh, we would all have a lot more opportunity here. Next slide. Oh, that uh, that mountain goat video is narrated by Stephen Ranella, which is kind of cool. Uh, he does a good job. All right, now we're going to go through North American wild sheep. There's a couple different species of sheep. Um, we're going to go through them a little bit. This won't be as detailed as the the other critters, especially not the uh, the mule deer, the elk, and the antelope. But so 
North American wild sheep, like goat hunting, sheep hunting tends to be practiced by a few hardy individuals whose interest is more in the challenge than in filling the freezer. Um, sheep meat is excellent. Uh, if you've ever had domestic sheep, wild sheep is very similar uh, in that if you do not take care of it in the field, it can get rough quickly. But it, if you take care of the meat, it's going to be very good. It's uh, some of the best wild game I've ever had has been uh, bighorn. And uh, it, it'll just blow blow you away. The lamb, I, I guess they're not really lamb chops. They're bighorn chops. Anyway, they're very good, like bordering on the best elk I've ever had. So let's see. Um, males usually weigh less than 300 pounds and females less than 150 pounds. The dressed weight of a 230-pound sheep is about 140 pounds. And a sheep that size will yield around 80 pounds of meat. You have to remember, though, like what we say elk, the head was 39 to 60 pounds. A Rocky Mountain goat head is going to be a lot more. It's 60 to 70, like of a for a mature male. Those uh, those horns are big. I have seen a couple of these, and it is staggering just how big they look and how big that head is. It's just like wild. Um. Anyway, so the season structure varies. This is often a once in a lifetime. But um, people don't know about this. I'm not sharing a secret. You can Google it right now. But uh, there is an over-the-counter sheep hunting option in the lower 48. In, the, in Alaska, there's a lot of those in the lower 48. There's one. It's in Montana, and essentially it is called the hardest hunt in the world. An over-the-counter tag for non-resident is about $1,200, give or take, uh, depending on the year they, they increase it, and then there's hunting licenses and all kinds of other stuff. But really, it's uh, I've wanted to do it for a long time. I've often thought about not putting in for any draws and saving my money and then just buying the over-the-counter sheep tag. Now, it is a less than a 1% chance of success. But because what you're doing is you have to, based on the access, you, you are hiking no less than 14 miles. And often you're hiking about 70 at high altitudes above 10,000 feet. And you're basically walking in to southwest Montana, very close to Yellowstone or in the same greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And you're waiting for sheep to start their migration out of the park. Anyway, it's very, very hard to do. Uh, again, they say it's the hardest hunt in the lower 48, but it seems super interesting and it's super cool that these critters have responded or rebounded to a point where you have an over-the-counter season, even if it is extremely limited. Um, next slide. So uh, first one we're going to go over, the sub, not subspecies, but the various species of wild sheep in North America is the bighorn. Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep is the, uh, the kind of iconic species that everyone thinks of. They think it's a bighorn sheep, even though a lot of people will call them mountain goats because they see the curly horns. They think goat. Nope, it's sheep. Um, let's see. Bighorn sheep cannot move through deep snow the way mountain goats can, so they prefer drier slopes uh, with less than six inches of snowfall a year. The sleep's winter range usually lies at lower elevation, and bighorn sheep graze on grass and shrubs. And the fall and winter, they seek mineral and salt licks. If you want to see one of these, uh, winter is your time because they come down to lick the salt on the roads. And they are at a very low altitude. You'll see them in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Thompson Falls, Montana has a really cool, um, if you're ever in Missoula, uh, let's say you're just so excited to be a BHA member, you want to drive out to our headquarters and see me in person and buy me something, um, if you wanted to. If you drive an extra 90 minutes up the highway, you're in Thompson Falls, Montana, and they have a really great bighorn viewing area where you're going to see kids, you're going to see rams, and it is, it's a really cool thing to see. Anyway, next slide. Uh, doll sheep. So this is the next type of sheep. This is a thin horn. So if you break these sheep down, you have uh, big horn sheep and thin horn sheep. So they're all North American wild sheep, but the doll sheep is a thin horn type of sheep. And you'll see in that picture specifically, the horns are slightly thinner than the big horn sheep. So uh, again, same kind of uh, basic habitat, dry, drier meadows, mountain slopes, always on rocky outcroppings with cliffs nearby. Uh, they very rarely leave this rugged terrain because, like the mountain goats, like the sheep, they their biggest defense against predators is being where predators don't want to go. Um, their biggest uh, predators really are wolves, golden eagles, bears, mountain lions, and humans. Um, let's see. This is, uh, I don't want to say it's the only white sheep, but because you can have uh, the next breed of sheep we'll talk about also has a white phase, but this sheep is is white. It is a white sheep, so it is one of, uh, it's often a trivia question. I'm not giving anything away, but if you do come to the BHA rendezvous in a month, uh, we are going to have a meat eater trivia section. 
which we're asked a bunch of like nature and conservation based trivia questions. I don't know if this will be on there, but if it is, now you know the answer. There are four Alaskan mammals that are white. They are the polar bear. Everybody gets that one. Uh, most people get the doll sheep. Most people get the mountain goat. The fourth mammal that it's white is always the, the, the throwaway that nobody gets. It's the beluga whale. Fun fact. Anyway, next slide. A little off topic there, but I'm excited about rendezvous. So next one is going to be the desert bighorn. So the desert bighorn is a subspecies of bighorn sheep that is native to the deserts of southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. So this would be a bighorn, not a thinhorn sheep. You'll see it's very, very similar to the, uh, the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. It has a thinner coat, it enjoys a more arid habitat and to various uh, parts of the West, but it is a much, uh, very, very close to the bighorn sheep. Um, they have an interesting genetic kind of uh, adaptation is that their body temperature can go up or down a few degrees depending on their environment and they'll still be fine. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've ever gone into the hospital at a temperature of 101, like it's doesn't feel great and that's really only three degrees where these can um, can go up three to five degrees or down three to five degrees and they're still okay so uh, this desert bighorn they're in Idaho they're in Nevada New Mexico Arizona you can get them a couple different places I think you can even draw them in West Texas you can draw a tag for them but uh, pretty interesting this is often the hardest of the four species to draw a tag for simply because there are fewer of them uh, but you can if you were very well off financially, you could also go to Mexico and buy a, you know, a hunt for one of these for sixty to eighty thousand dollars. Next slide. Oh, so the next one is the stone sheep. So this is what we talked about. Um, that could be white. So this does have a white variation or a light gray, but it's not the same kind of white as the doll sheep. So the stone sheep is more southerly than the doll sheep so it's going to be more like british columbia in that coastal range so you see they have white markings on them but overall they are brown or dark gray or even black um the parts of the sheep that are white include the muzzle the belly the rump and the back of the legs the are further north than the rocky mountain bighorn sheep but further south than the doll sheep these are also a species of thin horn sheep um anyway next slide Oh, black bear. That's Trevor with a black bear. Back in the animals I know about. Good. Um, so there's a spring tag, or spring seasons, and there are fall seasons. Uh, I have only killed bear in fall seasons. I would love to do a dedicated spring bear hunt, but it seems like every time I go on a spring bear hunt, I see a bunch of turkeys. And every time I go on a spring turkey hunt, I see a bunch of bear, and I can never get the right tag in my pocket for where I'm at. So uh, spring season normally is April 15th through May 31st, or sometimes all the way out through June 15th. Uh, depending on the area, I know like the areas around Missoula, Montana, because they're closer to an urban center, let that spring season go longer all the way out through mid-June, because uh, they want to control those numbers because they get into the dumpsters, they cause a lot of problems, they interact with humans in a negative way. A couple different options. There is a spring hound training uh, season in many states, um, May 26th through June 15th. It's a little different. They want to give the spot and stock hunters about a month of uninterrupted hunting before they set the hounds loose, and the hounds are only in specific parts and specific zones. Uh, we are going over, so if you have to drop, no hard feelings. Again, we are going to, uh, the recording will go on YouTube here by the end of the week. But um, in the fall, it goes from September 15th to December 1st. If you have a rifle tag for something else, uh, like a mule deer or an elk or a moose or whatever, uh, for 300 bucks in Montana, you can pick up a fall bear tag over the counter and it's pretty interesting. Uh, just kind of diversify your, uh, your opportunity. If you're in Idaho, one of the coolest things about hunting in Idaho, uh, check the regs. I have heard rumors that this is up for discussion or change, but currently, as of Trevor designing this slide, if you have a Idaho elk or mule deer tag, you can shoot a bear with that tag and tag the bear instead of the elk or mule deer. Um, I had to read that part of the regulations quite a few times and then call somebody before I was like, am I reading this wrong? But no, it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting thing in Idaho. The theory being, if you're not going to take an elk or a mule deer, you're going to take something that eats elk or mule deer, therefore leading to more elk or mule deer later. Um, so these tags are over-the-counter in Montana. There are draw units. Uh, there's some over-the-counter units in Colorado, over-the-counter units in Wyoming, but some places you have to draw. You just have to check. Um, Colorado does not have a spring season. It only has a fall season. And uh, anyway, pretty interesting. Meat care. If you are 
let's say over the counter in Colorado, you're starting the first weekend in September. Uh, it's going to be hot. Like it's been 92 degrees when I've been hunting bear before and they're, they have black hide, they're attracting sunlight. As soon as you knock that bear down, you've got to get it in the shade. You've got to get it broken down. You've really got to get, uh, take good care of that meat. Um, I know we just talked about it with elk. Black bear are not the same amount of work as an elk to break down, but it is a process. It is a, uh, it's a whole thing. So once you knock a bear down, like that's the rest of your day is getting that hide off in a very responsible way, making the right cuts, taking care not to cut the pads because you want to save the hide. You need to put the fat in its own bag. You're going to fold the hide skin to skin, hair to hair. Do not vac seal this hide. Now, if you're going to put it in a vac seal bag, you can seal or like vacuum it out, but don't like, you don't, you're not smushing it super tight. You just want to hit that seal button before it gets there. So it still stays loose. You could use a big trash bag and, and uh, tie it off before you take it to your taxidermist. The reason you don't want to press it down into some sort of vac sealed bag is you don't want that, uh, that hide or that hair. If the, a lot of vac sealed bags have some sort of texture to them, and that can actually permanently crease that hair to where when your taxidermist goes to tan the hide, we get the hair back and it kind of looks like your bear had a little bit of a perm or like a wavy look. And that's from the texture of the bag. So don't vac seal the hide. Um, same thing. You take the front quarters, the rear quarters, you know, the loins, the neck meat, all that stuff. Real good. Next slide. And I think I have a recipe coming up soon. Yes, very soon. Okay. Black bear habitat. Spring, you're looking for, black bear hunting is all about food. Right? You're either hunting them in the spring when they haven't had food in a while and they've just got done uh, hibernating, or you're hunting them in the fall when they're getting ready to eat the more calories than they've ever eaten the rest of the year to get ready for their big sleep. So spring, early food sources, a lot of time this is grass uh, that grows on southern facing slopes in the mountains. So if you can sit on a north facing slope looking at a south facing slope, uh, you want to see a couple different drainages. We'll get into some exact uh, kind of examples here later, but uh, grasses is often the first thing that comes up. Uh, carcasses, skunk cabbage, depending on where you at, where you're at, skunk cabbage often uh, the first thing that comes up in the spring, and they really like that. It's a uh, grows in wetlands mostly. Now on carcasses, depending on the state you're in, you are not allowed to deliberately sit on a carcass and hunt bear over that carcass. Right now, some of the times what I have seen is I've seen bear habitat where I think bear will be, and then see bear and later find a carcass on that slope where, oh, that's why this bear was coming here. But depending on where you're at in the world, where what part, what state you're in and what those regs say, you may not be able physically, legally to harvest a bear over a carcass if you know the carcass is there. Whether you place the carcass there or not, doesn't matter. Depending on your state regulations, consult your, uh, ask your biologist, ask your local game warden if you have any doubts. Uh, fall, berries and gut piles. Um, I know Colorado does this a lot where uh, you pick up your archery elk tag and you'll buy a bear tag over the counter and wherever you knock down your elk, you go sit that gut pile the next day and you'll harvest a bear. And Colorado is really apt to get rid of or, or severely reduce the number of bears in a lot of zones uh, to increase the number of elk. They have quite a few bears in Colorado. So again, check your local regulations, ask your game warden, ask your biologist. Next slide. Uh, 127 to 156 grain bullets are well suited for the job. Again, 6.5 Creedmoor to 300 Win Mag. I know it's a black bear. People get excited, but uh, it's just a bear. It's uh, it's a big version of a raccoon. You're not. Uh, you don't need a uh, a piece of artillery to knock these things down. Um, but on shooting, I know people will say center of the center. Actually, I have I have some of those slides coming up. Uh, hunting types. We already talked about hounds. We talked about spot and stalk, but bait. Uh, some people will, will run bait sites. Uh, Idaho, I know, is a big Western state for baiting. Uh, and that has a whole separate set of regulations and trials, tribulations, all that stuff. Next slide. Um, so FWP, which is uh, Montana's version of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, has a bear ID quiz that you have to take before you pursue bear in their state. Uh, you can do so at that link. But uh, it's really, it's a bunch of pictures of grizzly bears and black bears, and you have to pick which is which. And if you don't score high enough, you don't get your buy your bear license. Uh, it's free to take, and you can take it as much as you want. But it's, it's a great course whether you plan on hunting bears or not. Uh, a couple of the key points here is color doesn't matter. Grizzly bears can be almost black. Black bears can be light like grizzly bears. Don't look at color. You look at a shoulder hump or lack of a shoulder hump. 
taller ears versus shorter ears, kind of like the mountain goat. You're not looking at one thing or the other. You're looking for a series of things. Um, they call the grizzly bear like a shovel face or a dished face, like uh, it very clearly slopes down to the nose, whereas a black bear has a nose more like a, more like a dog would, I guess is a, a regular straight kind of nose. Uh, black bear tracks are short. You see the claws are very close to the... Uh, the pads there, like uh, one and a half inches, maybe two inch long claws. Whereas a grizzly bear, you look at like four inch long claws and those claws are raked out farther from the pad. The other thing to note is if you look at, if you draw a straight line across a front, a front bear front foot track with a grizzly bear, that straight line can intersect your main palm pad and all the finger pads. With a black bear, the foot is curved enough that that straight line would not intersect them without touching the, um, the toe pads. You see what I mean there in that picture? North, south. Um, sounds confusing. Not as confusing as it sounds. Take the uh, the bear quiz. Pretty great, uh, great setup for it. Next slide. Hey, Trevor, real quick uh, yeah. on this. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever hunted bears or seen bears or seen bear tracks in the wild. Um, I have seen both black bear and grizzly bear. It is staggering to think about how much bigger a grizzly bear is than a black bear. The the track is easily double the size. So if you look at it and think, well, maybe that's a black bear, put your hand next to it, you know, whatever method. But if it's just looks bigger than you think it should, it's probably a grizzly bear. I know that's yeah. not very scientific, but, you know, it's practical application. No, no, that's that's great information. That's something that I missed. Uh, a good black bear, like a black bear you would be proud of, anybody would be proud of, uh, especially in the mountains of the western states, is 300 pounds, really 220 pounds. And some some zones is a good black bear, whereas a grizzly bear, you're looking at 400, 500, 600 pounds even. And then you get up into Alaska and grizzly bears are 1,000 or 900 pounds, grizzly slash brown bears, depending. But uh, next, we're going to get into bear shooting. Um See so on the picture on the top, you'll see how if you went behind the shoulder, this is specifically for archery equipment. If you are using a rifle, you don't have to worry about it as much because a rifle of appropriate caliber and uh, bullet grain weight is going to push through that bone pretty easily. But if you are using archery equipment, notice that that bone is thicker than a whitetail bone, thicker than an elk, thicker than a uh, mule deer. You are going to have a real hard time with that arrow setup that you have for whitetail punching through that uh, that bear's front shoulder. So if you went a little bit further back, you'd be more successful. I know people will say middle of the middle, uh, which means between the front leg and the rear leg, pick the exact middle and shoot there. That's fine. I think that would work. If you went a little bit forward of there, it'd be even better, but just be aware of that front shoulder. If I am shooting a bear with archery equipment, which full disclosure, I've only shot one bear with my archery equipment. Um, it was a quartering away shot at 11 yards. I really like the quartering away shot because you have much more, much more of those lungs open without obstruction of that front shoulder. Uh, hunted with people that have put an arrow in the shoulder and it looked a lot like that bottom picture there to where the barrel just sticks out, barely penetrated, and uh, the bear runs off and the bear will reach around with its, uh, with its mouth and yank that, that broadhead right back out of it and run off and be fine. I butcher, I've helped people butcher bears that have broadheads in them, so they're tough. You want to be farther back than you would with a white tail or any sort of ungulate. Next slide. So uh, now we're just going to talk about mature bear. This is for black bear purposes. So figure one is going to be, this is the biggest thing I see. I take people bear hunting as they see the first bear and they get all excited. Like, oh my God, it's a bear. And they shoot it. And then they're like, oh, it's, it's an 88 pound bear. Because uh -huh. it's very hard. I don't know what it is. If it's the fur or it's this mental block that people don't quite recognize. Um, a big bear and a little bear and the difference, especially it gets harder when you get, you know, a thousand, 700, 500 yards away trying to make that call. But in general, if the bear looks like it's got real long pointy ears, it's probably a young bear. If it's got a real thin muzzle, it's probably a young bear. Um, if it looks like squat, fat, um, shorter distance between the nose and the ears, it's probably a bigger bear, a more mature boar or more mature bear. Um, small ears, broad muzzle. If the ears look like it's on the side of its face versus the top of its face, the good indicator that it is a, a larger, more mature bear. Next. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see the chat here. 
Cinnamon bear in Colorado tends to confuse a lot of backcountry travelers. I've ran into the guys telling me to be careful. There's a grizzly bear. A lot of black, bear, black bears in the area are brown in color, but no different than other black bears. That's a great point, Ken. Um, actually, we have a one of the auction items that will support the Armed Forces Initiative at this year's rendezvous is a backcountry bear camp for two um, in an area that has a bunch of cinnamon bears. Really cool uh, experience, and I highly recommend you to send it to your friends or bid on it yourself if you're interested. Um, but there's, I, I would love to get a nice cinnamon or a nice brown or a color-phased black bear. Uh, I think that would be really cool. Anyway, my favorite thing to do with bear, you can do like bear chops, you can do great uh, biscuits and gravy and sausage or whatever you want to do with this bear. But my favorite thing is corned bear. Same as you would do like corned beef, I like to do corned bear. Um, not that bear has a weird flavor or anything, but I find uh, with most folks, they're a little hesitant to eat bear. And uh, when I corn it and I serve it, uh, and like the picture that's coming up, it's they, they don't even notice that it is bear. Um, depending on the time of year that you shoot your bear, you could have, and the region of the country you shoot your bear, you could have dramatically different tastes. Um, again, like I said earlier, I've never harvested a spring bear, never had the opportunity. Fall bears have often been berry fed bears, and they are very like that fat is smells of blueberries. It's a pretty wild uh, experience to gut a bear and smell blueberries. But uh, anyway, so two to five pounds of bear roast, uh, trim it of all the uh, the gristle, the silver skin, the fat, three and a half quarts of water. Um, you could do like a jerky cure, or you could uh, just look up what the, uh, like they have like a pre-made corn seasoning. They sell at like Walmart or whatever grocery store you have near you. Uh, they'll kind of have all this stuff in it. But if you wanted to make your own, um, sugar, bay leaves, pickling salt, uh, pickling spice. Now, I do a quarter of this. I, I do a quarter cup of pickling salt. I know it says three quarter. Um, I just, I don't know if it's the weight or if uh, it's a lean meat versus a beef or something, because I'm normally using a, uh, a, a recipe designed for beef, but it always ends up too salty when I use three quarters of a cup. So I use a quarter cup, or sometimes I'll supplement quarter cup of pickling salt, quarter, quarter cup of regular salt, but uh, just try it. I would just tell you, be hesitant on the salt your first time and add salt as you go. But anyway, you're going to combine all ingredients, bring to a boil, remove that from heat. Then you're going to, once it's um, not hot anymore, so this is where it's not going to cook, you're going to put your roast, your bear meat in there. You're going to put it in a glass, Ziploc bag, a pot pan, something with a, with a lid, and uh, stick that in the refrigerator for anywhere between five and seven days. Um, the longer you leave it, the more it, it becomes corned, I guess. But uh, then you're going to remo remove the meat, rinse it. Some people, depend, so now you want to put in a slow cooker. Um, some people put in a slow cooker with Guinness instead of water, like do the Irish corned beef thing. Um, some people cook it to a point and then they slice it, like deli meat, slice it very thin. I prefer to cook it until it shreds or pulls. So you have like a pulled, uh, like a pulled pork kind of texture. I think that goes to like a grilled cheese or it goes to, uh, not grilled cheese, but like a grilled Reuben sandwich or a grilled... Uh, like corned beef hash, you're going to make that yourself. I just I find that when you pull the meat versus slice the meat, you get a better consistency and a better uh, better flavor. Next slide. So this is a close up. I really like this picture. This is just uh, this is bear meat with uh, potatoes and onion. Put some cheese on top of it and uh, two eggs and then some hot sauce. And uh, really, like I feed this to uh, my two year old and my four year old little girls who are the most discerning eaters that I've ever met. I feed this to non hunters. I feed it to people who've never had bear and they, everybody loves it. It's, it's a good recipe. Next. Uh, this is the same bear meat. This is just on one of the, like a grilled Reuben sandwich, uh, rye bread, sauerkraut, bear meat, uh, big old dollop of thousand Island. I'm a dipper with sauces instead of putting the sauce on the sandwich. I think if you put it on the sandwich, it makes it soggy. If you put it on the side sandwich doesn't get soggy, but, uh, yeah. Another thing you can do with your bear meat. Next. Oh, caribou. So, hey, Trevor. Shoot, man. Hey, real quick. I'm sorry. Does, do you think it merits talking about trigonosis real quick? Oh, yeah. No, that's a good call. Um, go ahead. Um, okay. So, bears are carriers of uh, bacteria. And correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm not a scientist. You know, I'm just public school educated um, of a bacteria called trigonosis. And Basically, if you don't thoroughly cook your bear meat enough or sausage or however you prepare it, you as a human are susceptible to this bacteria and 
uh, it, it can make you very sick. Make you yeah, very, it, very eats, sick. it eats your muscles from the inside. It's uh, you get worms and it's it's a whole thing. Uh, so that's a good point. You want to cook your bear to 165 degree internal temp. Um, and it's not so much like, uh, I mean, pork can also get trichinosis. It's a, uh, what's pork bear, whatever you want to call it, like kind of red meat, kind of not, but uh, that like middle quality. It's it's red meat of an animal that eats mostly a protein diet. But anyway, carries trichinosis. You want to cook it to 165, which is why I like corning it, because then I never have to worry about whether it is... Uh, I'm killing everything because I'm slow cooking the shit out of it. Like it's, you're pulling it. You're not doing uh, like bear steaks. And if you wanted to do bear chops or like pork chops, but with bear, uh, just make sure you cook them, cook them all the way. Make sure they're done. Um, it's a good call out, Justin. Sorry, missed that one. Anyway, caribou. So there are five subspecies of caribou in North America. This is a picture of our Fort Wainwright uh, installation leader. His name is Mark Duval. Mark with a C. He's very particular. Don't say Mark with a K. Uh, with a, uh, give or take a third of a caribou on his back um, up in, in Alaska. So, all right, the first of the five subspecies is barren ground caribou. Barren ground caribou live on the tundra, the central Canadian barren ground, and uh, I have tundra in there again. They live on the tundra, which is what Mark's standing in. It looks like, uh, essentially, it is a green version of where antelope live. Um, it's north of the Brooks Range in Alaska, the northern third of Canada, where you really get into the same areas you're going to find polar bear and seals and all kinds of stuff in the winter. Um, anyway, the next uh, species is the mountain caribou. So the mountain caribou is in inside the Alaska Range, inside the Brooks Range in British Columbia. They're going to tend to be larger than your barren ground caribou because they're getting more nutrients because in the barren ground, uh, they're eating this like lichen and small uh, types of grasses. Versus mountain caribou have more variety to their diets. So they get larger, they get larger antlers, and they are overall larger. Then you have the Quebec slash Labrador, Labrador caribou, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, the Northwoods, Eastern Canada. Pretty interesting. So when I was, not even when I was growing up, back in the 1950s when my grandpa was growing up, that was the thing to do in the East was to get an over-the-counter Quebec caribou tag, drive 14 hours north, uh, through International Falls, Minnesota, and go on a caribou hunt because they were there. They were in northern, they were in northern Wisconsin. They were in Michigan, uh, Upper Peninsula. They were in Minnesota. They were a very not I want to say common, but they were a species. Now the only, and you see through global warming, through all kinds of other uh, natural issues that are happening, caribou have receded northwards. Um, they are what's called like a like a canary in a coal mine species, where they react. Because they are so dependent on one single type of ecosystem, when that ecosystem changes, like with uh, climate change or whatever, they are immediately susceptible. So like when they built the um, the, the oil pipeline in Alaska that runs from uh, Dead Horse, Alaska to Fairbanks, it took a caribou 10 years to cross that pipeline. Like very easy to cross. They could just duck under it. Like not a, I've seen the pipeline, but because it was a change in their environment, they just do not adapt well. It took them 10 years to mess with that. But anyway, um, so Quebec, Labrador, um, Eastern Canada, Michigan, Minnesota, the Northwoods is this other type of caribou, much smaller antlers, uh, but a similar size um, to the barren ground caribou. Really interesting. Uh, you still have them, but I do not believe you are allowed to go hunt them currently. Uh, the population will not sustain it. Then you have woodland caribou. So woodland caribou are going to be down like British Columbia, um, Idaho, and the North Panhandle. Um, if you are a Western guy, you know, like the Targhee National Forest used to be called the Caribou Targhee National Forest, which is kind of on the west side of Yellowstone, western Montana, eastern Idaho, uh, because it was an area full of these woodland caribou. And uh, anyway, we the last time I believe was 2016, we had caribou in Idaho that crossed the border at the very top in the panhandle. Anyway, uh, hopefully they come back. Meat care. So meat seasonality. August, um, so caribou, you're going to hunt earlier in the year normally, but uh, in the August season, it is hot and humid, getting into even that first week of September. Um, and when you're on a caribou hunt, you're normally out there for eight to 10 days, so you don't have the option to get it back to a cooler, to a bunch of ice, to a refrigerator, freezer, whatever. So they'll sell this. If you ever go to Alaska, like you can buy it over the counter anywhere. It's citric acid, and essentially, it's a powder. You're going to mix it with water, and you're going to spray down your quarters of meat. With the citric acid, it's going to help build a crust around it that's going to help it sit and uh, maintain in that kind of August or September not ideal conditions for 
six, 10, even, even 14 days sometimes. Uh, you're still going to want to follow all the same precautions, put it in bags, put it in the uh, away from direct sunlight. Uh, we were on a rafting hunt where you're rafting in the river and then you hop off and go hunt caribou, come back to the raft, raft a little more. Uh, so we'd prop up the rafts to make artificial shade because like you could see in the picture there, there isn't, uh, there's no natural trees up there. So next slide. So habitat in Alaska, caribou prefer treeless tundra and mountains during all seasons, but herds in winter in the boreal forest, uh, which means they will leave like the summer, they're up by the Arctic Ocean. The closer you get to winter, they go further into the mountains, further south, further inland in Alaska to get away from the freezing cold north. Um, they calve in the same general areas every year, but migration routes will vary to get to those calving areas. Uh, an adult bull is going to be smaller than an elk, um, about 350 to 400 pounds. Mature females are about 225 pounds at the biggest. Uh, really, when I not, I had a two and a half year old caribou uh, that I shot, and it uh, was like a big mule deer, not not massive, but much less daunting to pack out than the elk. Oh, we just talked about where they live. They're a herbivore. They eat uh, plants, willows, uh, lichen, all kinds of little stuff. Predators, bears, and wolves. They will have one calf a year, and uh, it genetically is the same species they have in like Russia, Siberia, but they call them reindeer over there. Next slide. Caribou hunting, 400 yard shots are common again. And um, that's based on the terrain in the barren ground caribou, like you see in that picture there. Not a lot to hide behind, much like antelope hunting. You're going to have to crawl, and uh, but unlike antelope hunting, you don't have uh, cactus to worry about. You're just going to get wet because you're crawling through two to four inches of water at all times. Um, crawl, get close as you can. I shot, uh, we had caribou shot on that trip at 80 yards. We had caribou shot on that trip at 400 yards. Um, I'd say be comfortable to 400, but if you are dead set on 300 as your limit, you'll be able to figure it out. Again, same as uh, same same rifle you would use for mule deer or elk will work on caribou. Um, that 6.5 six, Creedmoor all the way up to 300 Win Mag, all good calibers, and we had multiple, we had 30 out sixes, we had 6.5 six, Creedmoors, we had 300 Weatherbees, 300 Win Mags, all kinds of stuff on, uh, we had a 450 Bushmaster on that trip. Like, you can do, uh, you can take care of caribou with a lot of different calibers that are all fine. Um, glass and caribou are always moving. So kind of like antelope, they're going to move all times a day, but you're hunting them August, September. So you're, they're going from one, two, three animal, six animal packs or six animal herds to get moving all to the same general area. And the closer you get to that breeding area, the more they're going to be in 50, 100, 100,000 animal herds, right? Like just huge. So it depend, and it really just depends on the weather and seasonality. You could get there August 27th and see onesie twosies the whole time. And all of a sudden on September 7th, something switches and you're seeing 50, 100, 300 animals a day, all in like big swathing herds. But they are always moving. Um, find a high spot and glass and make a play. Now, the biggest difference between antelope and uh, caribou glassing, spot and stock, making a play is for the, uh, the antelope, a lot easier to walk in the desert than it is on the tundra. Uh, just Heads up, while walking on the tundra with empty packs of just water and snacks for the day, we were averaging 1.5 miles an hour. Like that's us moving, trying to get there fast. Uh, with full packs, it was less than half mile an hour. It's just hard to walk on. If you'd like more on this, our next version of this three-part series is going to be how to DIY caribou hunt. So I'm going to give you a lot more information in that one. But uh, anyway, next slide. So another uh, another recipe here. We have caribou shepherd's pie, which is essentially shepherd's pie, just with ground caribou. Um, I think caribou is some of the best meat ever. Um, had steaks, burgers, done the shepherd's pie with it. It is incredibly mild, like just, I, I hate to compare it to beef because that seems makes it seem like beef is the gold standard to shoot for. And I really think all wild game speaks to itself individually, but caribou is pretty incredible. Like it is you could do anything with it. It responds to flavoring really well. It's not overly any one. It's not naturally like musky or naturally sage or anything. It was a delight to eat. But anyway, caribou shepherd's pie, it's essentially the same as shepherd's pie, but just with caribou meat, you can do anything with this uh, meat that you would do with beef, your burger recipes. Um, you could corn it. You could do whatever, but it is uh, phenomenal. Highly recommend it. 
Next, uh, next slide. So that's the instructions and a, and a picture of some shepherd's pie that I made uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, with the caribou. Next slide. Uh, ooh, spot and stock tactics. So we're gonna need a little tactics. I know we're way over time here, guys. That's fine. Um, it's gonna go on YouTube, and uh, this is the most interesting of the three for me on Western hunting. So we're gonna keep going. Uh, so picture on the left, picture on the right. Uh, there is a picture on the right is a zoomed in picture of the picture on the left. So the picture on the left are actually 14 elk that you can look at. And the picture on the right is my spotting scope on two of those elk. And uh, those elk are 537 yards from where I am right now, or where, where I was when I took that picture. Uh, I see the one on the left is a cow, the one on the right is a spike elk. Next slide. And I say that to, uh, I, I show you that first picture because the biggest change going out west is just how much you glass it's uh you'll notice after like three days your eyes really hurt and it's because you're sore your focus muscles are sore from looking through your binoculars looking through your spotting scopes so off much more often than you uh than you than you have in the east you can go ahead and press play on that if uh if the volume will let you anybody hear what you're saying no anyway he's talking about glass and uh that same video is up on our YouTube channel if you'd like to check it out. But uh, that's Dave, who's our Alaska state leader, and he's talking about glassing uh, caribou that are about three miles away from us. And he's saying the first caribou you see when you tell it has ant horns or antlers, you're like, you're like, oh, my God, it's a Boone and Crockett. It's so huge. It's massive. And then, like, the longer you look at it, the smaller they tend to get until you actually see a Boone and Crockett caribou. But anyway, um, so what you're looking for at glassing points, you're looking at high points with views of multiple slopes. Uh, one of the big things I see Eastern folks do their first time hunting is they're essentially treating a glassing point or they're looking uh, like a big tree stand. And that's not necessarily wrong, but what I find is people will overcommit to one spot and sit it for, try and sit it for multiple days because they're sure something will come through. It's not, these critters are not like whitetails. They don't have a nine square mile range where they'll come through. If you're not seeing them, you got to move. You got to move. You got to stay mobile. But, uh, but anyway. You want access routes to each target area because that's the other big thing of spot and stock is there's a stock spot that's going to come after spotting. So you, it does you no good to look at a bunch of land that you cannot get to. Um, skylining the hunter. Uh, skyline just means you are silhouetted. Like uh, you don't look like you blend in with the back. Your backdrop is over the, the horizon line where you, you look like a blob. Um, Sunrise, sunset, uh, depending on a lot of these, it's when you want to be up there. So you're hiking up in the dark, you're hiking back in the dark. Uh, next slide. Let's see, still hunting. Um, that's some muskox that were like 50 yards from camp in Alaska. It's pretty cool. But uh, still hunting, uh, next slide. There's some interesting ways to still hunt. Essentially, you're just creeping through the forest with your bow or with your rifle and um, covering ground along likely habitat areas waiting to encounter game. Uh, the thicker the habitat, the more likely uh, you are to have success with still hunting. Um, like aspen groves in Colorado, you can kind of creep through and just kind of drift with your bow. And you could walk up on elk and get within 40 yards. Like it's, it's, it is very doable. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, Dustin could probably speak more to that. But the thicker it is, the easier it is to spot and stalk. To a point, um, sure. a lot of the times you find yourself in a situation that you can only go where the forest allows you to go. Otherwise, you end up creating a ton of noise, which I mean, I guess is kind of the whole point of that. But um, it can be done. It is you can be successful that way. You just got to be quiet and take your time. Yeah. Um, spot and stalk. Some people swear by it. Um, I'm a. Or I'm sorry, still hunting. Some people swear by it. I am a spot and stock guy. Uh, I like to look around, plan my route, and then go after it. But depends. Next uh, slide. So we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, there's a couple of uh, very basic rules that I see people violate all the time on accident. Or like, I shouldn't say violate. I should say be unaware of before they go west and then end up at the Walmart or the Sportsman's Warehouse trying to make up for a mistake in packing. So first one is want and waste, which we talked about. Uh, it's based on state. So I think I pulled this portion from the uh, Wyoming website. So this is what you are, you are required to take in Wyoming. 
which is your back straps, your quarters. You can leave the ribs, you can leave uh, the neck. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. You can get some great meat out of the uh, the ribs and the neck, especially for burger and grind. If you have two kids, you can, I live on burger. Like you can put it in a mac and cheese, you can make tacos, cheeseburgers, chili, whatever. But anyway, um, in Alaska, I mentioned this earlier, you have to leave those ribs bone in and you cannot leave the neck bone in. Interesting, but each state is different. Make sure you know what you need to take. Evidence of sex. You need to leave a ball or a nipple on one quarter. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you can also leave the penal sheath, which is that white part. If you've ever broken down a white, a white tail, you've seen the internal part of the penis, and it will naturally kind of adhere to one of the, uh, the rear quarters. That does count, uh, where you can leave that there as a evidence of sex. What I do normally is I will just take the scrotum, like fur on, hair on, and just cut a little square around it and leave that attached to one quarter, where I'm not even messing with it. I'm just... Is so very clearly evident. Like I will have the uh, the the sausage and the uh, and the bangers or whatever you want to choose your euphemism there. But I'll I'll leave the testicles and everything attached to one quarter. Now with a cow tag or a uh, doe tag, uh, they have those nipples in the rear uh, or in the uh, rear half of their body. You can leave one of those attached, hide on as well. Um, make sure you do that. A lot of people get excited on their first animal and they just zip through like they would a whitetail leave evidence of sex attached the head doesn't count the antlers don't count it has to be physically attached to one of the limbs or to the meat somewhere um, also depending on the state you're in you may not be allowed to debone meat so i know alaska you have to leave it on the bone except for the spine you have to leave the spine in the in the field but everything else has to be on the bone and uh then there's like some rules in montana where you can't bring cannot uh, bring the spine anywhere outside of that county or like some cwd rules apply but uh, just check with your state agency where you plan on hunting uh the next one hunter orange uh some states require it. alaska you don't have to wear it at all idaho don't have to wear it at all montana you have to wear a vest and a hat colorado vest and hat it just depends i bring a vest and a hat wherever and uh i'll always normally at least wear the hat wherever i am oh wyoming is vest and a hat as well but uh so those are the three things that I see people uh, kind of accidentally break the rules on the most. Uh, there's other stuff. Again, read your regulations, email somebody who knows, like anybody on the AFI uh, BHA page, any of your state liaisons, installation leaders, or board members can help you. And uh, oh, you can also call that biologist. But uh, I think that's the end. Next slide. I think we're just here for questions. Questions. Look at that. Yep, so that is part three of your introduction to Western hunting. I hope you know more now than you did when we started. Um, again, all this is going to go on YouTube. It's all going to go in blog posts, and I will email a link out to everybody who signed up for this. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it.